Our next speaker is our keynote speaker for the evening. So we have uh, Sunny Hamzi with us, and he is the managing director of the International Interest Global Risk and Intelligence Company. He advises government institutions, global companies, and NGOs on the geopolitical dynamics of Europe and the MENA region, and has significant expertise in advising on commercial issues related to a volatile political environment and their implications on market entry, market expansion, and management of stakeholders. The frequent guests on Al Jazeera, both Arabic and English, Sky News, BBC, and other outlets. So by a show of hands here, how many have attended maybe one of the, the talks or listened to some of his, um, his work online? Been able to, to get that. Okay, so for those of you who have, we know you're in for a treat. For those of you who haven't, this is gonna be an awesome opportunity. I have to say, I have the privilege of attending one of the talks and really, it's, mashallah, he's gifted in the ability to, to, through his storytelling, be able to connect us to our roots and really allow us to feel a sense of pride in being Muslim and in our mission of what we're here to do on this earth. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, uh, it's always good to push back on such introductions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Man kan yuridu al-izzata filillahi al-izzatu jami'a. Those who seek glory, let them know all glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah doesn't share it with anyone. I am well aware that the words that you have resonated with over the past few months are not my words, but rather what has resonated is the fitrah inside you that resonates with words of justice. So long as one stands with justice and speaks the words of justice, Allah elevates them. But if tomorrow I was to say the opposite and stand for injustice, Allah will humiliate me just as quickly as he has elevated. I am aware of this and I'm aware that all glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that it is your sense of justice that has resulted in your resonance with words of justice. That's the caveat in the beginning. Second point is, Jazakumullah al khair for bringing me to California to this wonderful, wonderful weather, to beautiful sunshine. Sometimes I've told myself I shouldn't make these weather jokes because when the last time I made them, the next place I was supposed to go was San Diego. And they say San Diego is a really beautiful area, right? Wrong, it's not beautiful. I'll tell you why. Because when I got there, it was pouring, pouring down with rain. And I saw absolutely nothing. And the irony of it is that I actually left Phoenix, which was sunny. And we drove to San Diego. And you know those hills just before you enter San Diego? So you, just as I entered those hills, it started like it was waiting for me. Sammy's here, yalla. And then, of course, I went to Seattle afterwards. I went to the thunderstorms in Houston. Atlanta was raining. Raleigh was raining. New York was raining. Detroit was snowing, minus 13 degrees Celsius. So jazakumullah al khair for bringing me to sunny sunny california you can tell how starved i am of the sun there are some americans who told me sam you focus a lot on our weather here in america i tell them try come and grow up in a country where you see five days of summer a year and those five days never come at the same time so it's very problematic when you see sun you're like allah it exists <laughs> jokes aside it's an honor to stand here to speak at this event i'm a big fan of sabid and I'll explain why. The reality is that we're all watching a genocide unfold. And we're all watching an ethnic cleansing unfold. And we're all watching it live streamed. We're all seeing those videos being shared. We're all seeing the genocide. It's no longer something you read about in the books. It's something you're seeing with your own eyes. You all saw the video of the man holding the garbage bag where he shouts on the streets. And he says, Ya Ibad Allah, Ya Ibad Allah. Has anyone seen his hand? Has anyone seen his hand? And then you look at him and you think, what on earth is he talking about? And then he says, Ya Ibad Allah, I found his legs. I found his torso. I found his arms. I found his head. Please don't let me bury him without his hand. You all saw the videos of two days ago, the girl crying, her leg has been amputated. She says, I want my leg. I want my leg. Please give me my leg back. You all saw the video of the man consoling his son. He's been told his son has to have both legs amputated. And he's consoling his son, telling him, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. But why is he consoling him? Because he's about to have his legs amputated without anesthesia. You all saw Sidra. 
playing with her cousin and then the next day she's hung from a wall with her legs blown off. Six years old. You all heard the message of Hind, Hind Rajab, sitting in the car surrounded by five corpses of her dead family. And the intelligent girl picks up the phone and she calls the Red Crescent. She calls and says to them, I'm stuck in a car. They say, where is your family? She says, all my family are dead, they're around me. She can see the body, she's there. She's in the car with the corpses of her family. She says, I see the tanks, they are coming towards me. The tanks are coming. So the Red Crescent tries to reassure her, reads Quran, talks to her, keeps her conversation. Eventually, when the ambulance turns up, she can see the ambulance, she can hear it. She's happy, she's about to see the ambulance. Boom, the Israelis, they hit the ambulance. They say, no one gets in there. Hind Rajab dies, six years old. She dies surrounded by the corpses of her family, desperately on the phone saying, I'm scared of the dark, please help me. She died in that state. You're all seeing uh, ethnic cleansing, the way families are being forced out of their home. But the atrocity of what we're seeing is not just the genocide that we're seeing unfolding. It's also the way that the world is reacting to it, desperately trying to find a legal loophole that adds nuance to a debate, that suggests somehow that 30,000 Palestinians, 12,500 children, there is a legality that allows them to be slaughtered in this way, we just haven't found it yet. That's why we're seeing laws being upended, that should, we, should it be allowed that we kill them as long as we provide humanitarian aid? So the difference between you know, Biden and between Netanyahu is that Netanyahu wants to starve them and kill them, but Biden wants to feed them and kill them. It's, there's a big difference between the two, apparently. You're all watching that unfold and you're all watching how many leaders, neighboring leaders, are not necessarily interested. Some are instead more interested in concerts or the like, which are very important. Shakira, Sofia Vergara, these are... I didn't know many of these names. Shakira I knew, but like, Sofia Vergara and these are I only discovered recently. I'm not sure it's a good thing. In any case, you see how the Israelis have entered Northern Gaza, Gaza City, Khan Yunus, and instead of the debate being how do we stop them there, they're saying no, we're going to go to Rafah, but we need to find a way how are we going to enter Rafah? In what way? What do we do with the Palestinians in Rafah? Do we push them into Egypt and leave them there, or do we kill them and slaughter them instead? And the argument is not whether the offensive should take place or not. The argument is how do we do it in a way that is PR friendly, that is market friendly. Sometimes I used to read those books, you know when you read about the Holocaust, when you read about Rwanda genocide, you read about Bosnia, and you say, how did the world just stand by and watch all of this happen? Today you can see how it was happening. Today you understand what the world was doing at that time. Genocide, it turns out, is not something that's straightforward, it's a nuanced subject. The reason why I start with this is to highlight a few changes to highlight a power that has manifested itself because it directly links to your community efforts here. The reality is that many of you yesterday or the day before will have seen that the Democrat majority leader Chuck Schumer came out and said that Netanyahu needs to be replaced. That the Israelis have gone overboard, that now there needs to be mobilization and movement in order to provide humanitarian aid. That's Chuck Schumer, the highest ranking Jewish representative in Congress, the Democrat majority leader. My question is, did he say it because he suddenly had a change of heart about the genocide? No. Did he say it because suddenly Biden asked him to? No. Did he say it because Netanyahu told him to? No. Did he say it because Benny Gantz asked him to? No. There's another power that manifested itself. Kamala Harris, the vice president, came out and said, we need a ceasefire. And did you notice how the audience started clapping? They started clapping. Acknowledging that the public opinion shift, that Americans are now in favor of a ceasefire, democratically they're in favor of a ceasefire. When they started clapping, she panicked and she said, only for six weeks, only for six weeks. Whoa, 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 please don't clap too much. We've seen many people. Macron called for a ceasefire. Macron, the French president, who refuses to apologize for French colonization of Algeria, but he's calling for a ceasefire. Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium calling for sanctions on Israel. Spain saying it's ready to recognize a Palestinian state. There's a reason all this has happened. It happened because of you. 
It happened because there is a voice that is roaring, that is very loud, that refuses to be quiet. And the reason why I emphasize this is because the reality is that community projects are not built top down. They are built bottom up. And that's how Sabil itself was created. The idea of an initiative on a table discussed to address a particular problem, to help to welcome refugees that have been driven from their homes because of war, driven from their homes because of poverty, driven from their homes with no sanctuary afforded to them. They flee to a place that they don't know, but it's the local community members who stand up and they say, we need to do something, we need to go and address them, we need to welcome them, we need to give them the clothes, we need to help to feed them, we need to help them with their jobs, we need to elevate them. It's the local community that makes that difference, that results in this change that has brought all of you here together on this particular night to discuss and celebrate the efforts of Sabir. It's the fact that it's the community, the ordinary person who makes that impact. The same way that it's the ordinary person who forced the shift in American public opinion with regards to Gaza and Palestine. I read the Reuters article, because I'm a nerd, I'm like that. I read the Reuters article. The Reuters article, when the polls came out that showed that Biden was behind Trump, Reuters said that one of the fascinating things about this poll is that Biden is falling behind Trump on an issue where American troops aren't even on the ground. Usually when people change their minds on opinion, it's because they have a vested interest in an issue. Our boys are dying abroad, our boys are dying in Afghanistan, our boys are dying in Iraq. This time it was nothing to do with that. Public opinion was changing over an issue where Americans did not have a vested interest in, where their boys weren't dying on the ground, where there were no American troops. Meaning that the reason public opinion was changing was because of the ordinary individual who was amplifying the message of the Palestinians, forcing the algorithm to deliver those, that message to people who had never heard of Palestine before. Now I'm not a tech guy, but in California there are many tech people. There might be some here. So, as somebody who's jahil in tech, Allah said, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge in case you don't know. So I asked these tech guys, guys, explain to me the algorithm, please. They said to me, an algorithm creates a bubble specifically for you. So if you like Kanye West, if you like these guys, it shows you only that. If you like, like me, Zinedine Zidane, Roulettes, 2006 World Cup final, when he humiliated Brazil in that semi-final. Bismillahi, mashallah, la quwwata illa billah. If you like Ronaldinho when he does the flip-flap, the most entertaining player I ever watched in my life, football or soccer, as you guys call it, has now become a bit more boring with its more industrious ways, it comes up. If you're somebody like me who discovers he likes things he never knew he liked, I follow an account of a chiropractor. Got a back problem? I'm a chiro. And then he just does something with your and you think it's so satisfying. It's so satisfying to watch at 1 a.m. in the morning when you should be doing something better and going to sleep. The point is, and even parody accounts, I follow this parody account, they took the chiropractor account, they go to a car, they make the mirror, they, they put it in a wrong position, and then they go as if they're trying to find the spot in the car, and they go like that. It's so satisfying to watch. But that's my bubble, that's my algorithm. Other people might see many different things. So I asked, so if everybody has a specific algorithm, a specific bubble, that means somebody not interested in Palestine would never see any Palestinian content. And they said, exactly. So I said, explain to me why people all over, why somebody in California called Samantha, who grew up in a Zionist environment, never heard anything about Palestinians, explain to me how the Palestinian content got onto her phone. And they said, because Sammy, when thousands of people share something, algorithm doesn't get affected. When millions share it, the algorithm raises an eyebrow. When billions share it, the algorithm bangs on the door of the bubble and it says, listen, listen, listen. I know you're watching some funky thing about somebody falling in a swimming pool and doing a prank, but you need to see this because billions of people are sharing it. We don't know what it is. We're just capitalists. We just like things that are popular. We're going to put it on your screen. So when David, Samantha, Sarah, Michael, Jeffrey, um, give me names. Charlotte, um, Cali, I don't know if Cali is a name, but in any case, California, which take the first part. California, when they woke up one day, when they were expecting to go through TikTok to go see the latest dance trend, instead they saw Mu'taz Azaza, they saw Plastia, they saw Hindal Khudari, they scrolled to the next part, they saw the, the kids, the picture of the hospital which was bombed and they see the limbs of the children outside 
those hospitals, those children lying dead. They saw the mother lying over the corpse of her son and she's screaming. She says, why couldn't they spare the head? Because the head has been blown off the body. They see the kids with their limbs amputated, crying, saying, I want my leg back, I want my leg back. What do you think Samantha, Jeffrey, Charlotte, Chris, John, what do you think they did? They didn't scroll past, they clicked the share button. When they clicked the share button, they ended up spreading it. When they spread it, they spread it to more people. And when Gallup went and did their polls about how the Americans feel, what is the current American public opinion, they were stunned to find that under 35s have become overwhelmingly pro-Palestinian. That Kamala Harris might be standing for Zionism, but her daughter is raising money for Palestine. The point that I'm emphasizing here is what brought about that American public opinion shift? What brought about that shift that has suddenly made Europe restore funding for UNRWA when Biden didn't want to? That made Canada restore funding for UNRWA when Biden didn't want to? That made Norway triple its funding for UNRWA when Biden didn't want to? That what is making all these nations change their minds? It's not some conspiracy theory. It's you, it's the ordinary individual. You who think yourself to be weak are the ones manifesting a power so great that it is causing the shift in public opinion and forcing the change in foreign policy. When South Africa heard your call, South Africa, may Allah give it every prosperity, may Allah give it every security, may Allah protect it from every evil. When South Africa heard your call, because the algorithm promoted the Palestinian content that you were sharing. South Africa took the case to the ICJ and I saw something I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. Israel is now on trial for genocide in the International Court of Justice, which has led to Japan, Japanese companies cutting their relations. They cut their ties with Israeli companies out of fear of the ICJ ruling. Ask yourselves, who brought that change? Was it Biden? No. Was it Blinken? No. Was it Netanyahu? No. Was it any of the neighboring leaders? No. It was you. There is a power that you are manifesting because the ordinary person is not weak or powerless. The ordinary person is not incapable. When those refugees turned up to California, let me tell you, as somebody who comes from a welfare state, as somebody who comes from His Majesty's Kingdom, the United Kingdom, where we have a wonderful national health service. And I have, when I came to America, I appreciated my health service. And let me tell you why. Because when I went to North Carolina, I was invited for a wedding in 2018. And a brother on the bus started vomiting. When he started vomiting, I did what any English, British person would react. Bro, just go to the doctor, just so your heart might be at ease. And the Americans looked at me horrified. Who goes to a doctor just for yatma in the Because in the UK, in London, let me tell you, I know it sounds like a, like, a, like a fable, like a myth, but if I wake up in the morning and I go, <coughs> Sumaya, so I tell my wife, Sumaya, did you hear that? Oh, Sammy, it felt a bit chesty. I won't cough again for two days, but I remember that memory of that cough. So I pick up my phone. Hello. Hi, does the doctor have an appointment? There's not an appointment for another two weeks. But if one gets cancelled, can you call me, please? Okay, thank you. Two days later. Hello, Mr. Hamdi. So what are your symptoms? You have to exaggerate a little bit. I'm coughing really bad now, but really chesty cough. Really, really chesty. Okay, can you come in three o'clock? Okay, no problem. I go in, I see the doctor. I know it sounds mythical for Americans, but just go with me, it's true. I go to the doctor, doctor says, Sammy, what's wrong with you? I tell him, doctor, I coughed. <laughs> he tells me, so what? I tell him, no, listen. Try to recreate it. <coughs> doctor looks at me. Puts that stethoscope on the chest. It feels good when they do it. <laughs> he goes, there's nothing wrong with you. I told him, doctor, please check. He said, what's wrong with you? What do you think it is? I told him, doctor, I asked Sheikh Google, hafadhahullah. Sheikh Google said it might be early stages of cancer. <laughs> doctor tells me, get out of here. Get out of here, as you guys say. Get out of here. I tell him, hadhar, I'm okay, I'm okay. I go home to my wife, I tell her, Sumaya, the thumbny. I'm okay. She tells me, yes, yeah, you were never sick in the first place. When I was in North Carolina, Miskeen Umar is vomiting. Then he vomits again. And we're telling him, just go check. He vomits the third time. 
And then we told him, guys, we're going to call ambulance. He was so shocked, he vomited the fourth time. No, he didn't, but in any case. And then they said, no, here we have to pay for your health care. And I said, you stingy guys, you stingy over $50 for ambulance. They all looked at me and said, who pays $50 for an ambulance here? Apparently, it's like $1,000 or something. وَعَيَّذُ بِاللَّهُ You find $14 billion for genocide, you can't find any money for health care, subhanAllah. Not you specifically, I take that back. Not you specifically. The point is, it's clear that the state is not intervening. When I came to California first time in November, of course I'm coming from the UK, right? It's first time in California. What do you think you do? You go to where you saw the stuff in the movies, Beverly Hills Cop. You want to go to Beverly Hills? Lit, because it's Beverly. Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills Cop, Beverly Hills. Wow. I want to go to Hollywood and see the, the wooden H-O-L-L-Y. Lit, yeah, it's just wooden letters. I don't know. I don't know. I just want to see and take a picture. Very underwhelming. You go there, you take a picture. You think, subhanAllah, the branding is incredible. As we were driving from Beverly Hills, I'm going by a, a parking area. Parking lot, as you guys call it. So there are so many tents in that parking lot. And I say to the driver next to me, I tell him, subhanAllah, I heard you guys have hippies, but this many. He told me, that's not hippies, that's homeless people. He told me, it's homeless people. The reason why I mention this point is, you look at the stories of Sabil and how they help the local community. It's not the state that is elevating these people. It's not the state that is providing that sanctuary. It's the ordinary person who has transformed the lives of those who are fleeing those conflict zones. It's the person who you thought should not have power, who is manifesting that life-changing power. Because in Islam, the very essence of Islam, the very relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ We created them in perfect proportion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that in perfect proportion to acknowledge that man is capable of incredible things. The reason why Benny Gantz, the Israeli minister, goes to Washington to meet with Biden, the reason why he has to leave Tel Aviv to go to Washington is because he's concerned that Biden is worried that American public opinion is shifting as a result of the ordinary people mobilizing. The reason why I'm mentioning all this, Chuck Schumer, the reason why Congress is talking about banning TikTok, they don't want to ban a genocide, but they want to ban TikTok. May Allah protect and preserve TikTok. May Allah bless TikTok. May Allah keep it for us. May Allah keep it for this ummah. May Allah protect that Singaporean CEO. He's Singaporean, he's not Chinese. He's Singaporean, he's not Chinese. He's from Singapore. Singapore is thousands of miles away from China, Mr. Congressman. I know there's a stereotype about Americans and geography, and I've learned it's not true. I've learned Americans are good at geography, American geography, but they're good at geography. This congressperson, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. May Allah forgive him. Views expressed are the speaker's own. But in any case, the point that I'm saying is the reason they are banning TikTok, think what they are banning. They are banning the means through which you are transmitting information. They are banning the means through which you are conveying that information. Because they acknowledge that the ordinary person has power. If you acknowledge that you have power, the question then becomes how do you use it? There are some like Sabil who use it to mobilize, to elevate people in the community. They go out, they see something they don't like in the community. They see people being abandoned. And they say, you know what, we're going to try and do something. First, it started off with Syrian refugees. Then it turns out there are lines waiting one hour, two hours, waiting for those packages. To elevate them, to help them, to provide that which is being denied to them elsewhere. That's power. That's the ability to make social change. You saw on the videos, the families talk about how their lives have changed. That's ordinary people who made that life change. That's not, we're not talking about billionaires, we're not talking about armies, we're not talking about nation states. We're talking about ordinary people in the community making that change. And the reality is, it has always been in the case in Islam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa salam to go to Pharaoh, Musa salam was legitimately scared. He was like many of us sitting here. You're telling us we have power. I don't feel like I have power. What do you mean I have power? I'm scared. There's a whole system against me. There's a whole world out there. There's whole nations. There's whole armies. There's whole... Uh, what do you mean I'm the one who's supposed to do it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa to go. Musa alayhi salam hesitates. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa halal uqdata min lisani yafqahu qawli. Allah, please expand my heart and make my path easy. And Allah, I have a stutter. I don't know if they will listen to me with this stutter. Then Musa alayhi salam says, Ya Allah, I don't want to go by myself. I don't want to go by myself. Send with me Harun. Let Harun go with me. Ashdud bihi azri wa ashdikufi amri. Make Harun go with me. Allah, don't send me by myself. 
Now, as a 16-year-old, I was 16. I was 16 when I first read Surah Taha. So when I read Musa's request to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my initial reaction was not, oh, this is what prophets do. My initial reaction was, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. How can a prophet who's met Allah, spoken with Allah, seen two signs of Allah, and now he's asking for more. He wants his brother to go with him. He's telling Allah, I don't know if I'm the right person to go. Usually you think if it was you and Allah, you'd go, Allah, yeah, ju -ju. Musa alayhi salam, no. He's telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, please send me Harun, I'm not ready to go. And when Allah tells him, this is what Allah tells him. Qala qad su'laka ya Musa. Musa, we've given you what you've requested. But here's the next part. Walaqad mananna alayka marratan ukhra. Musa, this is not the first time we've shown our favors to you. We were already showing our favors to you before you even asked. Before you were even born, we are the ones who told your mother to put you in the basket through the river to go down. We are the ones who looked after you. We were always giving you the blessings. You just never realized it. Earlier, Sheikh, you were talking about gratitude. We Sometimes we think about gratitude, about things we've seen. We don't think about gratitude, about things we haven't seen. When we were born, those times we forgot. The fact that some of us had parents to raise us, to look after us, the health. The fact we weren't born in a place where suddenly the hospital is bombed, where you don't have to have your limbs amputated without anesthesia, where you have all the benefits and health. Sometimes you forget to say thanks for even these things. You say thanks only for what's in front of you or you're depressed about what you already have because you fail to appreciate what Allah has already given you. Allah was telling Musa, Musa, you're making the request now as if you're lacking. Don't forget we've been showing you favors since the moment you were born and before. That's why Allah says, If you were to count the blessings of Allah, you would never finish counting them. And the reason Allah says this is to remind you of your power, that you're always capable. You always have the ability to do something. You always have the ability to make change. You always have the ability to shift society. You always have the ability to shift public opinion. You always have the ability to elevate someone's life. You always have the ability to elevate someone's standard of living. You always have that ability because Allah is doing it to you. Earlier it was mentioned by the Shaykh, اعملوا آل داود شكرا O oh, family of Dawood, show that, do show your thanks through the actions. If Allah has given you a blessing, give it that blessing to somebody else. If you have a home, be like Sabil and give a home to somebody else. If you have a blessings of food, share it with those who are next to you. If you have money, go and spread it and donate it to somebody who needs it. Show the gratitude through your actions. Because sometimes Muslims believe that Islam is an inherent right, not a privilege or a blessing. And let me tell you in Surah Al-Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about ulul al-bab, those who know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not people like Sami. I'm talking about those who know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-ladhina yathkuroon Allah qiyama wa qu'uda wa ala junubihim. Those who ponder the creation of Allah, they ponder Allah standing, sitting and lying down. And they ponder the creation of the heavens and the earth and the change between the night and day. These are people who think about Allah almost 24 hours. Those people say, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَبْ Allah, please do not take us out of this deen after you have guided us to it and bestow upon us your mercy. Those who know Allah know that Islam is not guaranteed, it's not a right, it's a privilege and gift that Allah gave you. So how will you show gratitude for this gift? Allah tells you, show that gratitude for that gift by embarking in actions where you display and shower those blessings on those who are less fortunate than yourself. If Allah makes you fortunate, show it on those who are less fortunate. Why? As was said earlier, you're not just helping them, you're helping yourself by saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I acknowledge the blessings you gave me. Allah, see my gratitude. See how I'm using that for your sake. The power of the ordinary Muslim sometimes is not recognized by this ummah which believes itself to be weak. But I always tell people sometimes, once upon a time, I actually thought about a career change from politics. I was sitting at home one day, relatively depressed. My mom doesn't like it when I use that word. She called me, she said, how dare you say depressed when Allah gave you so much, you were raised in a good household, you raised... I told her, mama, I didn't mean it in that way, mama. So mama, I don't mean it in that way, before she calls me again. <laughs> I thought of a career change and my wife says to me, why are you sitting down in the house the last three days? You know, you're, you're quite useless at the moment. You're not helping me with dishes. You're not helping me with a hoover. You know, like, what's going on with you? I told her, Sumaya, I need a career change. She said, why? I told her, because I've become a man of fitna. She said, what do you mean man of fitna? I told her, all I do is talk politics. Politics just divides people. I am Sami Fatan Al-Hamidi. She 
told me, calm down, whoa. She said to me, I have an idea. Why don't we do, you keep telling people, let's reconnect memories of the ummah. Why don't we set up a travel company and we take people, because when you tell people what books do you read, you spend 10 minutes, 10% telling people about the books, 90% talking about the experiences of people that you meet, like Sabir. Why can't we connect people with those experiences? One of the first places we went to was Bosnia. When you go to Bosnia, you find that the Ummah has never actually been weak. I might need a time call, by the way. I forgot my phone on the table over there. Alhamdulillah. I, 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 I'm notorious for misbehaving on time. But I know I can't compete with Iftar. I know. So any shower, any five minutes, just go like that. But don't humiliate me. <laughs> In Bosnia, when you go there, you realize, you, you see the story of Bosnia. The Ottomans were kicked out in the 1600s. Yugoslavian kingdom turns up. When the Yugoslavian kingdom turns up, they are concerned that there is a group of ethnics who identify as Muslim first before they identify as an ethnic race. So their solution is to make sure that these Muslims are a minority in each provinces. They divide Yugoslavia into nine banvinas, nine provinces. They make the Muslims a minority in each one. When the Yugoslavian kingdom collapses and communism emerges in 1938, there is a philosopher emerges, he's told to address the Muslim question. The Muslim question of what is this identity that transcends the Yugoslavian identity? What is this Muslim identity? How can we handle it? Their decision was to shut down Muslim associations, to close down, to imprison half of the Muslim leaders, and essentially to ban the printing of the Quran. 1980s, the Yugoslavian kingdom collapses, Bosnia emerges, Serbia invades, commits a genocide in 1995. Vladic says I'm here to wipe out Islam. Bosnia today remains an Islamic heart in Europe. But when you ask who are the people who managed to deliver that and preserve that, the Bosnians will tell you it was the ordinary Quran teacher. The ordinary teacher who taught the hijabis who were banned from university. The ordinary person on the street who used to squeeze and smuggle food to the prisoners. The ordinary students who refused to give up La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah even under that persecution. When you go to Turkey and they tell you about Ataturk and lifting the chains of Ataturk, you see that it's the story of the ordinary people mobilizing and choosing to exert that effort. The point that I'm making here is that you who feel yourself to be powerless are actually historically the most powerful force. And this is where I want to go into that final straight. Sometimes I appreciate that when somebody who looks like you says you are powerful and strong, it doesn't have the same impact because I look like you. Ah, who are minna? He's from us. He's trying to make us all feel better. So sometimes I feel like that while Sahih Bukhari and Muslim are very good for Muslims, Sahih non-Muslim also works. So in Sahih non-Muslim, you find, I know you're chuckling, but Sahih means authentic. So I'm getting authentic non-Muslim sources. <laughs> in Sahih non-Muslim, we find that when it comes to Palestine and Israel, millions are being spent to silence, not nation states, but to silence you. In Sahih non-Muslim, the threat is coming from the ordinary people who keep speaking and raising their voices. In Sahih non-Muslim as well, we see that Blinken travels the world to try to find help to silence you. Some people have said to me, Sam, you exaggerate about the power of our voice and the power of us as ordinary people to make change. But then when you read the seer of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you go back to the first 13 years of the da'wah some Muslims and the Buna Muhammad the poet he says we are all reflections true so I can't talk about me without talking about you sometimes when you read the first 13 years of the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you tend to skip over it very quickly because you consider it to be a period of weakness the Muslims are being beaten up, the Muslims are being persecuted, the Muslims are being tortured Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has to leave Mecca and he has to flee afterwards but then when you go back and read it, ask yourself the question, what made Quraysh feel so insecure in the midst of their weapons and wealth and money? What is it the Prophet ﷺ had that made them feel so insecure despite their weapons, their wealth and their money? And there is a wonderful scene in Mustafa Aqad's film, The Message. Where Abu Talib is lying on his deathbed and he's meeting with the leaders of Quraysh. He's dying and he's telling them, all Muhammad wants from you is one word. And Abu Sufyan replies and said, if all Muhammad wanted was a word, we would have given him a hundred words. The problem is the word he wants. The problem is this word is making Umar ibn Khattab who leave the elite of Quraysh to join the supposedly weak and persecuted Muslims. 
that this word is making Musa ibn Umayr who leave the luxury of Quraysh to go and join the supposedly weak and persecuted Muslims. That this word is making people with money mobilize and spend their wealth on those who are less fortunate, who have no power to do anything. This word of the Prophet Muhammad is so powerful that our weapons and our money are unable to snuff this word out. Not only that, when the Muslims go to Abyssinia, to Najashi, Najashi is the NATO ally of Quraysh. He's their economic partner. Transatlantic Treaty. Trans-Red Sea Treaty in this case. When Amr ibn As goes and says to the Muslims, says to Najashi, I want to bring the Muslims back. Najashi says, not for a mountain of gold will I return them to you. Because the word of the Prophet ﷺ moved him so much, he was ready to compromise the economic and political ties. Because of the word of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, Macron called for a ceasefire when Biden didn't want him to. It's the power of that word. The word that shifts foreign policy. When Abu Sufyan came back, he said the Muslims are not affecting our foreign policy by virtue of their word, by virtue of them speaking out. When the Prophet ﷺ, after 13 years is told by Allah to leave Mecca, before that there is a pledge, the pledge of Aqaba. The word of the Prophet ﷺ is so powerful, the word, remember he doesn't have an army, he doesn't have money, he doesn't have wealth, he doesn't have control over the media. But Aus and Khazraj still turn up and say to him, because of this word, we are ready to give you everything that we have. Because of this word, we ordinary people are ready to mobilize on your behalf. And Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he can't believe it. So he stands up and he says, do you know that by standing up for this word, this Prophet has no army and no money. The moment you choose to go with him, you're about to enter a path of struggle. They say, we know exactly what we're getting into, but his word is worth it. There is a sheikh in New Jersey who said to me, it is New Jersey. I refuse to accept the other term that they try to call it because I like my imagination in the movies. We were sitting in a car once. Earlier, it was mentioned earlier that, you know, there is a struggle. You know, that part of Sabil building, expanding, going from renting to owning a property, managing organization. It's a struggle. There are challenges and you keep going through the challenges and the struggle. The reason why I like the way the statement was said with a smile is because the smile recognizes that that is the state that brings you closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a sheikh who was with me in a car in New Jersey and he said to me, Sami, you know Islam is problematic. He told me, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, He told me, what's wrong with you? Islam is a problem. He told me, what are you saying? What's going on with you? I leave the car now. He told me, relax, what's wrong with you? I told him, there's no context in which that statement makes sense. He said to me, Tablahda. The first 40 years of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, what was his relationship with Quraysh? He was Sadiq, Amin. They used to leave everything in his hands. They used to support him. They used to say he's a noble man who used to come. When did his problems happen? When he stood up and he said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. And from then he never had any peace in his struggle until he died on his deathbed at 63 years of age. The point being is that to stand up for what's right requires struggle. To do what is correct requires struggle. To go out on these community projects requires struggle. It requires you to get out of your comfort zone. That's why you always tell people that don't say Sami this Sami, because Sami is a rabble rouser on a microphone. There are real heroes here who mobilize in the community who go and they make change. And the reason why I believe that it's the ordinary people who make the change is to finish on a Sahih non-Muslim. May Allah forgive me. Heraclius is told by a priest that there is a prophet coming after Isa alayhi salam. So when he hears about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he calls Abu Sufyan who's trading in Syria and he brings him before him and he says to Abu Sufyan, I'm going to ask you a series of questions about this prophet. One of the questions that he asks Abu Sufyan is, who are the people supporting this message of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Who are the people giving their all for it? Raising their voices, mobilizing, donating, moving, going out into the community and making the change. Being like Abu Bakr to liberate Bilal of Arabah. Going out and giving food to those like to Ammar ibn Yasir who's just been tortured. Who are those going out to those less fortunate and helping them? Who are those doing it for the sake of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Abu Sufyan doesn't say it's the billionaires. The way some Muslims say I shouldn't do anything until I have money to move. 
Abu Sufyan doesn't say it's the military generals the way we say, wait for the armies, otherwise there's no point. Abu Sufyan uses a derogatory term. He says, Aradiluna. It's the lowest of society, the ordinary people, the ones who are supposed to have no power, the ones who are supposed to have no significance, the ones who aren't supposed to be able to make change, the ones we look down on. Heraclius, Sahih non-Muslim, he says two things, or oh, this is in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari, but in any case, I'm saying Sahih non-Muslim on the basis of non-Muslim said it. Look what Heraclius said. He said, if it's the ordinary people who are mobilizing, the ordinary people who are donating, the ordinary people who are going out and pushing the carts, the ordinary people who are going out distributing the food, the ordinary people going out on their own, coming out of their comfort zone, if it is the ordinary people, Heraclius says, then this is the way of the prophets. This is the prophetic way. This is the prophetic way of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But not only that, and Sabir falls in this category as well. Not only that, Heraclius says that if it's the ordinary people who stand behind the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his initiatives and his message, if it's the ordinary person who keeps raising his voice, donating what limited resources they have, who keep moving and sacrificing everything for it to make the change in their community and beyond, then Muhammad will come to rule the land on which I stand on. This was Heraclius, the Roman Emperor, the equivalent of the United States of America at that time, if not stronger. He acknowledged that the sign of a project that will make revolutionary change is not one supported by billionaires and armies, it's one supported by you. And that's why it is my greatest honor to stand next to the Sabir logo and say, Ya Ibadullah, continue in the prophetic way because if you continue supporting it this is the way of the prophets and one day inshallah you will make that revolutionary change where you finally lift people out of dhulumat ila nur barakallahu feekum thank you very much another round of applause that was a pretty good treat right for those of you who have the opportunity to hear this for the first time. Moved or moved or not moved? Moved. Yes? And everyone's hungry. It's almost the third time. We'll we'll get going, inshallah. Um Jazakallah khair one more time for being with us and for sharing the reflections and alhamdulillah we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to receive. Hopefully our hearts are touched and our hearts are opened. Um, and if you would like to donate to Sabin, inshallah, the QR code is available on the um, on your table, so you can scan the QR code and give generously.